take us in. This is the, the Rex call for November of 2017. Uh, and I usually start our calls with a poem. Hey, Mark. So why don't I actually have two short poems to, to take us in with uh, this morning. The first one is, is titled How to Listen by Major Jackson and goes like this. How to Listen. I'm going to cock my head tonight like a dog in front of McGlinchey's Tavern on Locust. I'm going to stand beside the man who works all day combing his thatch of gray hair corkscrewed in every direction. I'm going to pay attention to our lives unraveling between the forks of his fine tooth comb. For once, we won't talk about the end of the world or Vietnam or his exquisite paper shoes. For once, I'm going to ignore the profanity and the dancing in the jukebox so I can hear his head crackle beneath the sky's stretch of faint stars. I'll read it again. How to listen. I'm going to cock my head tonight like a dog in front of McGlinchey's tavern on Locust. I'm going to stand beside the man who works all day, combing his thatch of gray hair, corkscrewed in every direction. I'm going to pay attention to our lives unraveling between the forks of his fine tooth comb. For once, we won't talk about the end of the world or Vietnam or his exquisite paper shoes. For once, I'm going to ignore the profanity and the dancing in the jukebox so I can hear his head crackle beneath the sky's stretch of faint stars. And the second poem is by Kay Ryan uh, and is titled, Nothing Ventured. Nothing exists as a block and cannot be parceled up. So if nothing's ventured, it's not just talk, it's the big wager. Don't you wonder how people think the banks of space and time don't matter? How they'll drain the big tanks down to slime and salamanders and want thanks? And I'll read that one again, too. Nothing Ventured by Kay Ryan. Nothing exists as a block and cannot be parceled up. So if nothing's ventured, it's not just talk, it's the big wager. Don't you wonder how people think the banks of space and time don't matter? How they'll drain the big tanks down to slime and salamanders and want thanks. Love those poems. Um, yeah, it's uh, partly, I, I use poetry at the start of, of calls and meetings uh, often as much as I can, uh, partly because it puts us in a slightly different place. It's like a little bit of a portal, a little bit of an entryway. And, uh, and once a, a group sort of uh, acculturates to it or accustoms itself to it, you sort of approach the beginning of meetings with the like, oh, okay, there's like a little gateway moment where, where we walk in and... Uh, and it's really nice that way. Did that? Did the poems bring up anything for anybody? I mean, the main thing that it, uh, as I was thinking about the, the the topic for today is trust, right, Jerry? A topic for most of our calls is trust, but yes, we're going to dive right in. Yeah. So what it what it made me think of actually was um, uh, what it means to trust yourself. When I when I listened to that first poem. Um, now, trust yourself at the most fundamental level of observation and connection with the world or with someone you love or with a business partner or with a child uh, and what it means to be present and to you know, trust yourself to be completely present and open to what's happening around you feels like the start of any generation of trust with anyone else. So that's what it made me think of. Yeah. And it's funny because the technology we're using right this moment, Zoom, and I'm the host, so I'm kind of, and as you were talking about that, I'm like, ooh, okay, I need, I need to actually be really present. And it's a struggle with all of this stuff. It would be so much easier if we were all sitting in the same room uh, or if we traveled here for a week on, on mule back uh, and we're sitting by a campfire where there was just no place else to go and no other demand on our time. But, uh, but here we are. And, and I'd love us to sort of pay that kind of mindful attention uh, to each other, as you were just describing. Hey, Dave. Hi, Mark. Um, and Sam, if you want to turn on your video, you can. I think we're we're on our way now. Anybody else thoughts from the the poems? I could barely hear it the first time you read it, and was so grateful you read it a second time. Right, I had to get out of whatever I was thinking about. Oh, oh, that's an interesting word. I didn't even hear that the first time. Thank you. 
Um, if you haven't heard him, uh, there's a, a poet named David White, and he's one of my favorite poets. He's got a bunch of videos on, on YouTube, and he recites poetry from memory, by heart. And he's really good at it. And not only his own poems, but a lot of people's poems, Derek Walcott and a bunch of others. And he has a habit when he reads, when he recites, of repeating lines a lot. Oh. And it really works. And I, I, I haven't found I can do it necessarily. I read through because I need the flow. But he stops and he'll do a sentence twice and then he'll go back and then he'll do a, a stanza again and then he'll keep going. And it works beautifully. Does he do it in a different, with a different kind of emphasis or different tone of voice when he reads it the second time? Or he's reflect? not, he's, he doesn't appear to be calling out different aspects of the line. He's just going back to it so you can hear it again. It just, and, and it sort of soaks in a little bit more that way. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Yeah. He's a, he's sort of a corporate philosopher. He's a very interesting fellow. He's got a couple of good books out uh, and all that. Any other like, thoughts? Go ahead. I was going to say, it's a little bit like music where you have repeats. And it used to be much more common in classical music where you do that, where it's become more formalized recently. Exactly. And it used to be in life before the days of radio and phonographs, it used to be that if there was a lot of applause, the, the orchestra would stop and go back and play that section over again, right? They would just, oh, okay, that was so good. Let's do it again. Um, Actually, I was thinking of, if you remember listening to Barack Obama's 2008 election speeches. He would actually use that technique quite frequently because mm -hmm. he spoke with a cadence that was intentionally poetic. And so there would be points where he would, you know, say something particularly powerful and pause and repeat it a bit more quietly, a bit more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And it was actually really useful. And I found when giving talks myself, that kind of technique can be very seductive to an audience. Absolutely. In fact, I just gave a talk a week ago uh, and I, I used a, um, there's a video online of a technology that takes Barack Obama's uh, face video images and projects him saying whatever, uh, whatever he said somewhere else, you can put on that avatar and make it look like he's actually saying it. So it's, it's kind of spooky because you can now create lifelike video that will fool you into thinking Barack Obama or whoever said whatever. But what's cute is uh, the video I used has uh, the avatar, the fake avatar on one side, and on the other side is a guy who's a, a, a young white man who's imitating uh, Obama's voice. And uh, he says, uh, and uh, you, you need to talk in this really weird timbre, and uh, you go up and you go down. And he does a brilliant job of emulating Obama's very interesting cadence, because I think that uh, you're calling out one of his sort of hypnotic speaking uh, superpowers. Um, hi, Esty. Um, any other thoughts before we dive in a little further? Cool. Oh, that was even, I, I think that was actually a nice beginning to this conversation about trust because how you speak, how you tell your story, the techniques that you use for conveying information is very, it, it is a critical element to how you gain or lose someone's trust. Um, also, the medium helps and interferes. It does, so there's, there's gains and losses from this video conferencing thing. Uh, for example, uh, uh, for example, uh, when I look at the camera, I'm m now more looking at your eyes, but normally I'm looking around the room, the room to see what you're doing. And the human eye, hi Carlos, um, and Mika, excellent. Uh, the human eye can, is very finely tuned to tell the difference. So if we're standing in front of each other, you can tell if I'm looking at the tip of your nose or in your eyes. Like the humans are very, very good at distinguishing that. So there's a little bit of loss of trust from the lack of actual eye contact. But then the reason I've, uh, the, 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 the first seven years of Rex calls were audio only, not video like this. And maybe there, there was a piece of that that was technology because you know, now we have things like Zoom that are pretty capable at delivering high quality video with lots of people, lots of faces in the room. Um, but also now you can see peripherally when somebody's engaged leaning in or if they're sort of off doing their email on the side or, um, and I, I, you know, we use the uh, general assembly hand signs like this means I agree, this means I disagree. Um, you can now see that across, I'm, I'm in gallery view now, so it's not just to the person who's talking. I can kind of see who's doing what to whom, all of which are really interesting kind of trust building uh, formats or, or ways of thinking about our or online interactions and how, how this, this stuff, the technology stuff, interferes with and amplifies our ability to do things, including the side chat. So I, I recommend gallery view with a side chat, um, or maybe on, maybe on this side for you. 
um, because then we can have a little side conversation as we go. Uh, and Mark, for example, put a, a, a chat in there about the Radio Lab episode of using Obama's face, which is, yeah, super interesting. We've got the uh, um, video stuff like, so my son's at this video only university and they use, I think, a format that looks like this so you can see the entire class in front of you all the time. And one of the things that they found is that it's really hard to, 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 to not show up. Um, so people really prepare for the classes because you can't dodge. You're sitting in front of all your classes. And even in a classroom, you don't usually see the faces of most of your classmates. So it's an interesting, you know, like the technology, using the technology to be better than in some sense, the face-to-face -face stuff is also interesting. And, then, and I find that I was always watching myself. But I don't know when Zoom added the hide myself button, but I have to use the hide myself button to uh, keep myself out of the, out of the picture. <laughs> That's interesting. Cool. Well, let's dive in for, um, uh, for some more. Let's head toward where, um, where we're heading today. And um, there we go. Uh, so a couple things. I posted a couple um, things that are coming up to the Rex list. And I'm also going to post an interview that, uh, that I did a week ago with Sheila Foster and Neil Gorenflow. Uh, which I put on YouTube, but I didn't, I didn't finish posting it to uh, Patreon or to the Rex list. Uh, but uh, it was super, super interesting. Sheila Foster teaches at Georgetown. She's a specialist in uh, land use planning and a variety of other things, uh, but also in managing the commons and has done a whole lot of work adapting Lynn Ostrom's principles for managing the commons, which is uh, something uh, that, that is a, a really interesting concept uh, in Rex. And, I'll go back and, and do a little more framing in a second. But uh, the interview is really interesting, but it's an hour long. And uh, so partly I'm interested in, in what would be useful ways to make those kinds of videos more accessible uh, uh, to more people. Because I think few people stop and watch a, an hour long video, but it was a, it was a great uh, conversation. And Neil, uh, he founded shareable.net uh, years ago. He um, is always ahead, like you'll see at the very beginning of the video that he's always, there before I get to things. I, I, I learn about some new thing that matters for the relationship economy idea or about trust. And it turns out that Shareable has already published an article on it, uh, you know, before me. So it's kind of fun. And uh, we went deep into that. Um, so um, also coming up on Tuesday, uh, and I'll put a note on the Rex list for this, we're going to have an unscheduled, an ad hoc uh, Rex call that anybody can join if you want to. Uh, around Arthur Brock and other people's project called Holochain. Um, and I had a, this is part of the conversation I had yesterday with uh, Matt Schutte and Nancy Giordano, uh, who might, uh, who I think can't make uh, today's call. Uh, but we're basically trying to figure out how to explain Holochain. And uh, if you want to join us on Tuesday, there'll be an invite, it'll be a Zoom call just like this. And uh, we're going to try to explain it and see what, uh, how to go about doing that. because. Uh, there are many paths into this, this holochain thing. Right now, blockchain is hot, hot, hot. Uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, ICOs are, are, are going all bubbly and frothy and going kind of crazy. And you know, how do you enter that market for platforms uh, that it might be transformative in, a, in an interesting way? So uh, we're going to do that. And then there'll be a, a few other um, Rex calls that, that are going to show up in the next uh, couple of weeks. What I'd love for you to think about as we have today's conversation and as you see these other calls and all that is, what topic would I like to um, have us talk about? Like what, what, like, you know, Kelly and the whole uh, world of service innovation and uh, the relationships that companies have with their customers and prospects and, and all that, like what are some good questions we could chew on together? And let's just put them in front of the group uh, and see where they go, things of that nature. Um, and there's no, there's no lack of topics to, to go into between you know, gender and, and race issues uh, around trust, between uh, politics. We're not afraid to dive into politics. There's plenty going on in the world at this point. Um, all those kinds of things are, are sort of uh, really fruitful for us. Um, so just as, as framing for uh, new people to the call, uh, Sam, I think, Sam and Carlos, I think this is your first uh, 
uh, first time on the call. Uh, and a few people, uh, we raise your hand if you're a Rex veteran, if you've been in, re in the Rex uh, group for, for quite a while. So SD, Dave, Peter, uh, Jame, saluting, thank you. Uh, and Mike and uh, Todd. Uh, so uh, know that like, you know, it's kind of a funny group because some of us have been in this group for, for a long time and some of us are just joining in trying to figure out, okay, what's where and, and where are we going? Um, and uh, what I want to do is put a little bit of, of uh, handrails around that so we know kind of what this is. Um, in a sense, this is a, it's a quest into understanding trust better. And I got to that, <laughs> that simple sentence is hard won for me because uh, it's a distillation of what I call the relationship economy. The reason this group is called Rex is that it's a relationship economy expedition. And the relationship economy showed up because I can't stand the word consumer. And I realized that some 20 years ago and paid attention to it. And the, I say often the smartest thing I've done for, for the last 20 years is pay attention to that word and follow it where it took me. Um, and it took me into a really disruptive kind of upside down, uh, a topsy turvy world where I realized that most of the institutions that we take for granted, our educational institution, our electoral systems, uh, how we control traffic and design streets, a whole series of things, um, how we reward people, you know, uh, how we create reward mechanisms and all that are basically designed for mistrust of the average person. And that we threw away things like society and relationships uh, and uh, the, the general connectivity uh, that people have. So the relationship economy is an exploration into does hundreds of groups around the world that are already designing from trust is what I call it, but they figured out that the average person is trustworthy. So if you go to Wikipedia, for example, um, uh, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia uh, says in many an interview, you know what, people are more trustworthy than we think they are, which is a lovely kind of, it's a lovely sentence to just keep in the back of your head as we're doing this expedition into trust. It doesn't mean that there aren't bad actors, it just means that on average, most people want to help. Most people have shown up and are willing to lean forward, lean in uh, and jump in and, and do interesting things. So that, that's the general framework and it touches absolutely everything. So uh, two nights ago, I had coffee with a, a local fellow who was a tax attorney and is really interested in alternative forms of company organization uh, for benefits, uh, uh, all, all sorts of other kinds of things. And then we, we sort of wander in the conversation. Turns out his wife does horse gentling. And he says, do you know anything about natural horsemanship? I'm like, my eyes, I think my eyes went completely wide. I'm like, yes, oh my God, horse gentling. And, uh, and I, I talked about how in an, in an early Rex meeting, we actually spent an afternoon uh, talking about the trailer for a documentary about one of the first horse whisperers, a guy named Buck Branneman. And all I did was I, I played this two and a half minute trailer. I can, I can put the link uh, in our chat uh, in a bit. Uh, I played the trailer and then I went back and I played the first sentence of the trailer. And the first sentence is something like, uh, when, when, you know, when Buck does this, it's kind of spooky. It, it, it's like voodoo. It's, it's, it looks like something that shouldn't happen. And, and what Buck Brandman is doing is he's walking into a ring with a wild horse that, or a horse that has some behavioral dysfunction. And he's, he's treating it in a way that they join up. They form a trust relationship. And after a while, the horse has got its head on his shoulder or is following him around the ring and will let him put a bridle on it and will let him ride it. And it's, it's, it's the opposite of breaking horses, which is what the general conventional wisdom is for what you do with wild animals, you break them. Um, so the relationship economy is really fun because it goes all the way over to horse gentling, but also includes workplace democracy and open source software and microfinance and all these interesting movements. And when I go over and I look at Shareable or the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation that Michelle Bowens runs or other kinds of places that are also exploring the wide landscape of, of what's available, what's possible, they're looking at the same movements, the same sorts of issues. It's just that we have different ways of trying to explain what this is. And I'm really interested in um, how do we explain this? Like, well, I think, you know, 100 years from now, um, whatever message crystallizes out of this era is the one that we'll be telling a hundred years from now. Right. And I'm, I'm designing my, my, I'm finishing the design of my talk for Friday uh, for the disruptive innovation festival right now. And uh, part of what I think I'm doing up front is I'm, I'm going to say, look, there's, there's dozens of possible solutions. There are people who've written really good and interesting books about how to fix the world. Why haven't we fixed it yet? Right. 
And so somehow we need to, to, to create um, partly the catalyzing thought that is going to shift us into the next economy, whatever else it is. And then there's clearly um, a death match going on right now uh, between many different parties for control of the political apparatus, for uh, who gets to determine what things look like, you know, what we're going to use, what rights we're going to have, all of that. That's, that's playing out you know, really big in the, in the public sphere right now. So that, that's kind of the, the general backdrop for this relationship economy thing. Let me pause for a second and, and answer any questions that you have, because there's probably a million questions, or, or there might be none. Are you open for comments? You bet, Chris. Uh, so I just want to make a, a comment on uh, first the significance of the, of the trust issue, um, uh, and not just in the economy, but in society, and then a, a note on misconceptions around trust and, and really getting scaling factors right in terms of how the language is used. Uh, on the significance, uh, some of the global polling that's been done recently is showing that worldwide, um, citizens' trust in governance is at the lowest level that it's ever been measured. And it's around at the 40% level uh, in the most recent uh, poll, I think, that was released last year. And it's just interesting. I don't know what it means at all uh, that uh, I, you know, the current president of the United States approval ratings are right about that 40% level. I mean, if you want to judge whether it's good or bad, uh, there's, and if most of the world doesn't trust government, then it's an interesting question. Uh, just, I, I think the, how we relate to one another uh, at the scale of a family and how we relate to one another at the scale of an economy or society are two really different things. And this is my point about, um, about distinctions and misconceptions. Karen Cook, who's a uh, a professor at Stanford University and a member of the National Academy of Sciences and who's an expert on trust, it's her field. One of the things I've learned from her is that in the science of trust, we distinguish between trust, the word trust, the concept of trust which we apply to people that we're close to, and uh, what the social scientists tend to use the word confidence as it applies to people who we're not close to. So as a scaling factor, language actually has to change. If we're using trust to uh, discuss the economy and society at a very, very large scale, scientifically, we're actually, it could be argued that we're using the wrong word. And I think they, the trust and confidence live on a spectrum. And it's just interesting to ask ourselves what that spectrum is. Uh, but I do think it's really important to start with that distinction because otherwise it's very difficult to accurately set expectations around certain kinds of behaviors. And I think once you begin to associate trust with high degrees of intimacy and familiarity, personal familiarity and time together and all the things we have with the people that we love and the people that we're friends with, as opposed to the kind of feelings of confidence and bonding that get generated either over calls like this or in an economy where you're at the other end of a transaction or you're in an election and you're voting or you're just watching somebody on a video and deciding whether to vote for them, confidence feels much more accurate to me in terms of my emotional resonance to the way I, I relate as a human being to a larger scale entity. So I just wanted to start the discussion with those two, uh, those two comments. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Carlos, go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Carlos here, first time I'm joining this call. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for the invitation. And uh, one little thing that I never thought of, but uh, in Spanish, the word that we use both for trust and confidence is the same word. Which is ah. So I never thought of that, but that, that actually makes a lot of sense. I'm actually trying to write an essay about how, sort of how trust is evolving. And I keep using the word confianza to sort of hint at both concepts that you're talking about, Chris. So, mm -hmm. so just thought I'd, I'd add that. Uh, and by the way, I just posted, posted a link of an article that I read on a Swiss magazine a few months ago. And um, this uh, woman, Iris uh, Bonet, I think that's how the, her name is pronounced. Uh, she was, she talks about how, when it comes to, um, she talks about how the difference between loss aversion, sort of how we prefer to not lose versus to gain things. Um, that's sort of how we're, you know, we're wired as humans because of, you know, in the past when we were, you know, living in the caves, losing was very much riskier than losing now. And, um, uh, and she talks how we're actually, so let's say, you know, you may take a gamble if you think that you have a 55% chance of um, winning from the gamble. Um, but when it comes to people, if I say somebody may pay you back some money 
with a 55% chance of, of uh, 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 a 55% chance of possibility, most people would say, no, we need a much higher percent of, uh, uh, higher percent of success that somebody's going to pay us back than we need from just a gamble in a casino. Uh, and she calls this betrayal aversion. So what, what, what it says is that we don't like being cheated. We're okay with things going wrong, but we're much more careful of not being cheated. So the concept of fairness now becomes, mm. uh, when it comes to trust, it's not just, it's, it's, it's not a matter of only being confident something's going to work or not. It's like, is somebody taking advantage of me? Is there some sort of manipulation here, which I think plays a big part in the whole government conversation? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. So I just, and I just posted links to um, Iris's Wikipedia page and, an, and a piece she wrote about betrayal aversion, uh, which is interesting. So... There is a an example that we probably all see every day of exactly how dependent we are on and how much we embrace trust of each other in very, you know, in literally life or death situations. Drive a car down a street and you have a multi-ton vehicle, multi-ton weapon under your control, as does everybody else. And you trust that the people driving the other direction who will collide head on with you are go not going to because of a line painted in the road. I mean, just think about that for a second. We trust that because there's a line there, people are going to drive properly. And mm -hmm. they do, by and large, they do. But there's an interesting phenomenon that seems to be emerging. And I was talking to a, uh, uh, an engineer at um, Daimler-Benz about this. With the emergence of self-driving cars, one of the things that they're actually very concerned about is essentially um, people taking advantage of the, the combination of supernatural reflexes and total awareness on the part of self-driving cars and essentially bullying them. So I'm driving and I make a left turn and I don't, if there's a self-driving car coming, I don't care because I know that it will move out of the way because you know, it's this super powerful robot that will, that will do that. You know, not and, just and, most and of we time, and we and we know that the owner of the self-driving car will be sued into oblivion because it will make the news because 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 they will do any they will be driving more conservatively so I have right of way despite the laws. So, as yeah. human drivers, it, suddenly we have, if not permission, at least the permissive space to um, act in a way that would that would violate that trust that we have in other human drivers. And so it's an interesting example of a technology that makes us safer, that has the potential to encourage bad behavior. No, oh, totally. It's not the first time that something like that has happened, but it's an interesting um, manifestation of it. It's interesting too, because uh, one of the inspirations for my coming up with this relationship economy idea is a Dutch guy named Hans Mondermann, uh, who helped to uh, invent uh, traffic calming. <clears throat> I interviewed him, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2006, yeah, and he took me on a walking and a driving tour through Drachten in the Netherlands, <clears throat> one of 140 towns across the Netherlands that he helped uh, re-engineer. He basically helped them redesign the streets and intersections thoughtfully. And uh, uh, traffic calming is all about eye contact between drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists and motorcyclists at places where they cross, where they, where they might, might touch. And part of what he does is make the street very readable. He removes stoplights. He, he affordances and laws that are meant to make you slow down don't actually work, he says, and I agree. Um, but a road that appears to be kind of narrow where there's a cafe with people actually eating, you know, eating cake right by the roadside or a children's playground will make you slow down because you know that people will be hurt unless you slow down. And so the big conundrum right now is I, I believe that, that self-driving cars are coming faster, not slower. Uh, and how do you make eye contact with a, with a self-driving car? You don't, right? So very likely through logic like what Jamey just, just presented, there might be ordinances in the inner cities, just like today we have, uh, I forget what they're called, high traffic zones or whatever, uh, like in London, uh, they, they, it's very expensive to transit through the, the city uh, during business hours. They may in fact pass laws that only self-driving cars are allowed you know, in, in different parts of civilization. And that may eat its way out uh, much like non-smoking zones have eaten their way across the world, it could be, you know, if you really like stick shift driving right now, get a lot of driving in uh, because it could be illegal where you are, unless you're, in, you know, outside of the cities, in which case, you know, who cares how's it going to go? But, but I, I'm sad because that moment 
of taking back human interaction and making eye contact at intersections and reducing the accident rate, which is what happens when you do that, is going to go away. We, we, we will miss that opportunity because technology will hijack it. And I think a lot of that- I think you got, to, you got to add a, a cultural component into that, Jerry. I mean, it probably reduces accidents in, in Holland, but- it Reduces it, accidents everywhere. It's, people the say American drivers are too stupid. Go ahead. No, they, they, behave, they behave differently. And New Jersey is the case in point, right? Because New Jersey has unique driving rules. And one is the first left always gets right of way. Um, but another, the Jersey jump, right? So you, everybody out of a stop sign, the left goes first. And then another is that at the Jersey circles, if you, if, you make, if you make eye contact, you have to give way. And so you don't make eye contact. You mean that's a norm? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there are perverse norms in different places. Jersey also has jug handle intersections, which are really, really weird too. Well, they do lots of merging, and so the the, the idea that if you make eye contact yeah. just means you've lost the game. <laughs> That's really funny. You know, you know, Jerry. Um, uh, thinking about your overall uh, big idea of you know what what is trust in our era or a, a message about trust in our era mean, and listening to Jame and Carlos, Carlos, you made me think of. And when you talked about cheating, you know, what is the opposite of trust? And what does it mean to live in a, an environment of real distrust? And does distrust even adequately express what it means to have the opposite of trust? And Jamey, you, you made me think of, of different societies, you know, ones that have highly articulated uh, norms and degrees of trust, like in Japan and you know, others where, those, where they're simply chaos. Um, and... And what it made me think of is the simple common sense idea that trust and or confidence is hard to build and easy to lose. That's something that I've found in life is just a profound uh, experience of trust and confidence. And, and because it's so hard to build and takes continuous time and effort, uh, and because it is so easy to lose, as trust scales into confidence in government, there are real issues about how you how easy it is to break social capital and deplete social capital and how hard it is to build it. And what does it even mean? I mean, how much social capital are we destroying right now in the United States just living through this era, right? Uh, how do you measure that? These are really profound questions. Absolutely. I mean, I just look at Kevin Spacey a month ago and Kevin Spacey today. <clears throat> you know, the, the, the whole Harvey Weinstein fiasco and the... the there's sort of layers upon layers upon layers of trust issues that are that are bubbling to the surface because of all of that. Um, partly, I, I, for me, one of the biggest interesting questions is, if in so many of these cases, everybody knew, but nobody acted, what's going on? What's our responsibility? How does how do, how can we actually stop doing that um, and and fix these problems before they have to fester to the point where we're seeing sort of large scale efforts now to, to regain some of this uh, some of this land. Go ahead, Mike. I, I just wanted to um, Your volume is very low, Mike. I just wanted to introduce a quick example of, of how this how this actually works in practice right there at, at a hard corporate level. Right? So I, I had somebody stay at my house as a visitor, my Airbnb, one of my Airbnb guests who was a super expert in marketing and he was actually uh, you know, he was actually working with the head marketing team of a very large multinational and they were looking at a number of projects that they could do to try and boost their revenue share across a particular geography okay and what they had they had a list of like uh, 15 different ideas that they had of what they could do right he said the first thing that they did the first thing that they did to prioritize the list was to look at, sorry, was to look at. Uh, That's funny. How, was to look at was to look at how much IT would have to be involved in in any of the given initiatives, right? Seriously. Yep. Yeah, and the ones which had the biggest dependency on IT went straight to the bottom of the list. Okay. Well, that seems like a good decision making rule. <laughs> but the point was, and it, curiously enough, it was an organisation I had worked at actually trying to introduce a pilot system for, a, for a, a, a new departure. And it was blocked at every turn. And the IT department, absolutely, if you ever wanted to see homeostasis of a, of a silo in an organization at work, this was it. Yeah. There was, it was never gonna happen, not in a million years. And, they, and they threw away at least five man years of work 
can't finally cancel it this thing. And that, but fundamentally, that was actually all about trust. It was absolutely about trust. And right. the organization, the organization was one which prided itself on its advanced culture, on how highly it respected all the individual's rights, et cetera, et cetera. But the yeah. actual values in actual practice, no. So have you read The Phoenix Project? Have I read The, the Phoenix Project? I just typed it into the chat. Uh, it's also it's a derivative book of the goal. Uh, it, the Phoenix Project is a novel about IT, believe it or not, and it's actually pretty good. It's not Faulkner, but it it actually describes a mid-level IT guy who suddenly becomes the CIO because the other guy gets fired, and the CEO drags him into the middle of a highly dysfunctional organization where there's no trust. And it's the progress. It's the story of progressive disclosures that sort of explains what, how what DevOps is, modern DevOps, and how to get on top of feature requests and how to change everything. So it's really an, it's an IT novel. But I think a lot of people reading it at companies like the, like the client company you're talking about might actually help. It might sort of open up their perspective and open up interesting conversations there. Who knows? I, I actually think I, what's involved here, what was involved uh, was actually like fundamentally the organization was running on fear. And you could, you could introduce as much. You could it could be much deeper. Yeah as you wanted to but if you weren't dealing you weren't going to deal with the fear then nothing was going to happen um cool, uh, cool. Mika. Uh, hi guys uh sorry i was cloaking myself for a while because i really have to do a lot um i wanted to just uh, throw into the mix the something that's uh, been bubbling up in movement organizing circles lately which is the idea that you can only build real movements at the speed of trust and uh what people are trying to say is um, it takes time. You simply cannot build strong political organizations uh, in a rush and that too much of what we are building these days is, uh, is weak because the internet gives you a very fast boost and so you get to scale really fast but actually the leaders don't know each other. Uh, there's no real bonds between members um, and that this requires time, and unfortunately, nobody feels like they have time. Um, but if you make it a rule that you have to take the time to build strong, trusting relationships, then I, I and I, I see it here in what we're doing at Civic Hall, um, then when a, a hot button issue surfaces and somebody uses the wrong language and, and, and the call out culture jumps in of people attacking each other because, oh, you're not as woke as you should be, it can be done in a framework where, oh, but I still am your friend and I'm, you know, we're trying to struggle through this together. And what seems to be happening in an accelerated way in virtual space is that these conversations don't uh, heal. They, they actually get worse. We have, uh, you know, platforms that just make us uh, uh, more likely to distrust each other and more likely to call out each other and more likely to be triggered. So this idea of building at the speed of trust, I think, is really, really important, and and um, you know, part of a, it's a building block to what you're trying to do, Jerry. The juxtaposition of um, talking about call out culture and then also talking, and Jerry previously mentioning Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and the like, that actually illustrates or or, or underscores a really important element of the the trust relationships in in broader society in the at least in the West or in the U.S that have built up over the years. If somebody had called out Kevin Spacey or Harvey Weinstein five years ago, they would have been obliterated socially because, because of the power that the Spacey and the Weinstein, et cetera, have in society. Uh, it's only recently that that- Oh, you that, mean the caller outer would have been obliterated? Yes, okay, yes, sorry, exactly. I, I thought you meant the other way around. Was, that was ambiguous. Um, you know, the, the person who was calling out, who was saying, hey, Harvey Weinstein raped me, Right was not going to get there were many attempts over the years there were stories exactly. squelched there were spies hired that we read the stories it's incredible and, and so i think we need to be we need to be uh, conscious of the fact that um trust is, is sometimes i trust that i will be harmed if i behave in a certain way not i trust that that um i will be listened to right. and that is something that seems to be changing slowly grudgingly um fitfully Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's, it, it's important to recognize that call-out culture exists for a reason. 
um, because that for a long time people weren't listened to. The, the comments on um, your comments, Jim, and, and the comments on the speed of trust made me think about um, another example, Mike, in the corporate world. Probably, is everyone here on the call familiar with the Volkswagen scandal, the software, right? Dieselgate? Um, so the first, what I've been reading is the forensics on that scandal uh, show this moment, which apparently was actually documented, where at the very senior levels of Volkswagen, uh, one of the executives that was involved in the decision about how to actually respond uh, basically just said out loud, we just have to decide, are we going to be honest? And, uh, and that, to me, just expressed so much about humanity and how it relates to brand and how brand relates to trust and celebrity. Uh, and as I was thinking about the speed of uh, the movements at the speed of trust, well, the, the thing you can do to, it's easy to destroy trust, but there are, um, and there are no real shortcuts, but there are some shortcuts in the sense that there are trusted brands and trusted people who've spent lifetimes building reputations. Shakespeare's, one of famous quotes is, uh, the purest treasure mortal times afford is spotless reputation. And it made me think of, of what you could do differently to change the speed of trust. Um, whether it's in a movement or in a brand rollout, as you bring in people who have very high amounts of trust um, and who, and how that can change the speed of trust. I don't know the answer, but I think it fundamentally can. If you have the right people involved, you can accelerate. Um, can you accelerate the speed of trust? I don't know. What do you think? Can I add um, another, I think, element that you, you asked before, Chris, about sort of what is the opposite of trust, I think, of uh, when trust becomes mistrust. And I think, uh, I've been thinking a lot about how trust basically has to have an element of faith, which means living in an outcome without evidence. absolute evidence, right? Like no one trusts in gravity or trusts in that if I go into the rain, I'm gonna get wet, we just know it, it's, it's a certainty. So when we trust, it means there's some element that is like, well, I trust you, but maybe, you, you uh, disappoint me. And um, I think the problem, I think where I agree with, with uh, Micah, uh, Mika or Mika. Micah and, uh, Mika, is that you, to build trust, there has to be like little gambles, little tests, little experiments where you sort of start showing me the evidence to have bigger and bigger trust in you. That's why we date in romantic areas or we have interviews in the, in the work, work, uh, work life. Um, so I think there's, as long as, I think we're sort of let, letting, um, forgetting that we are uh, fundamentally limited biologically. Like there's all this, like the Dunbar number and how many people we can trust, how many people we can be familiar with. And, uh, and I think, and the reason I think, because, I've been thinking also, a lot also about why we lose trust. Like it takes a lifetime to build, but one mistake to lose it. Well, it's because before, like, like, like I said before, if you were uh, mistaken in who you trusted, it could have potentially deadly uh, consequences. So we became very careful about not trusting again somebody that can disappoint us. Uh, so if you add... The, limit of the, the biological limitations of how many people we can trust, the fact that we need a lot of evidence to, before we can make bigger and bigger trust. I, and I think the other element is that we're so bombarded now technologically. I think it's not just, um, like there's so many attempts to get our attention and therefore our trust in all these different directions that I think it gets really hard to, I think it's actually going to get harder. It's gonna get harder to develop trust because of technology than you used to before. Because before, I think you were, you were sort of limit, limited geographically to what or who you would consider trusting. Right. right? We, we like, didn't I have, have free, never met, free worldwide communications were not easy. Yeah, like Jerry and I met like twice in our lives, but, and I never met any of you, but this is already like a much bigger world than it was, than it is just me being in Buenos Aires. I'm in Argentina, by the way. Um, so, so I think this is, this is why I, what, what Miha said, I think it's even, Gonna, probably going to be an even stronger um, factor. Let me weave, uh, weave together a couple of threads. Uh, Mika, what, what you asked is a beautiful question. I, what I'd love to do um, is set up a separate Rex call around the question 
and invite in a couple of people who might be able to talk about it and, and you know shed some light on the subject. So let's make let's put that on the schedule for just Rex calls uh, and and give it some more time and and some more room to breathe. Um, Chris, you mentioned earlier about the words trust versus confidence, um, and and just a, just a couple uh, thoughts on that. Sometimes I define words more narrowly than other people do. So like the word community, a lot of people say, oh yeah, community, like there's lots of communities, communities are big. I, I, um, I'm influenced a bit here by Scott Peck, uh, who wrote The Different Drum, which is about community building. And for me, communities are usually groups that have, been, that have had a little trial by fire of some sort, which, um, and I, I can go deeper into sort of uh, Peck's ideas about this, but I, I tend to define com actual true communities no more narrowly than other people do. In case of trust, I think my definition might be really broad because I want a really large umbrella or bucket or tub to hold all these ideas in. And because when you say we're exploring trust, everybody's like, oh yeah, everybody has an idea and you'd be shocked at how few people, maybe you wouldn't be shocked, how few people have actually thought about it in any depth. So, so trust actually opens all the right doors because they, you know, we talk about blockchain and Bitcoin as, tr as the trustless systems. I'm like, really? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, you know, we talk about money as a, as a form of trust at a distance and totally between strangers. So I, I still, I like the framing um, uh, of trust for the, for the broader thing, but I totally understand what you're saying, or I partially understand what you're saying about confidence. And uh, if Kamala Forge were on the call, he'd be talking about sort of warmth and confidence as ways of, of gaining trust. Uh, uh, one of the, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown <clears throat> and her whole notion of vulnerability as the path to, to authentic connection and joy. I think vulnerability is interesting. And an exercise I did uh, in, in Sydney, Australia, I was working with a, a Suncorp, an insurance company there, and uh, I invented a tiny exercise. What I did was gave everybody post-its and said, okay, um, what to, put yourself in the, in, the, in the role of a corporate executive. What does the word vulnerability mean to you? And everybody was like, you know, danger, damage, weakness, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we put, up, put all those post-its up and talked about it for a while. And then, you know, put yourself in your, at home in your family. And what does the word vulnerability mean to you? And it's intimacy and closeness and proximity. And then we compared the two, the two little word clouds on post-its. And it was really, really interesting. And, and um, we have such different notions of what works at the organizational scale and what works at the personal scale. And I think one of the things that's happened is that, the distance that used to protect corporations and large organizations that let them lord over us and tell us what to do has just broken down and gone away. And organizations need to show up as peers in the arena now. And they don't know what that means. They don't get it. They have old, they have antiquated ways of communicating with us by bombarding us with messages, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's uh, yeah, that, a whole makes, bunch of dynamics. Go ahead, Chris. That makes sense to me, Jerry. I, I think that if you um, if you start to develop it as a not so much as a bucket but as a spectrum, and and I'm almost thinking I'm visualizing it like a two by two matrix where you know one axis is the spectrum that Carlos has sort of set up for us of you know distrust to to you know low trust to high trust or low confidence to high confidence or low confidence to high trust, and the other is scale. I, I feel like Carlos, you've almost you've led us to the, the $64,000 question, which is that as, as the world gets more complex and we get more at risk of ruining it, you know, whether it's through climate change or depleting social capital or poverty or, or inequality or you know, a lot of the major global issues we're facing, can real confidence scale? Can governance mechanisms scale effectively to generate very large scale focused movement on major issues. And it's almost a call out to the innovators of the world, like what does the state of the art and trust innovation mean? You know, at the human level, the technology level, it's a really big question. If we are putting as much energy into trust innovation as we're putting into you know, biotechnology. And apps. Yeah, you know, would that make a difference in, in the, the, the governance systems we need and how we interact with one another? It's, I think it's profound. Uh, and I just, I just like the way you talk about it, Carlos. So the three uh, words that have killed yeah. more interesting projects in, uh, that I've seen are, are it won't scale. It won't scale. Uh, partly, the softer stuff we're talking about, trust is about mo a lot about human relationships. 
And it's one of the softer skills. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the more feminine uh, attributes, I think, in, in relations and relationships. Um, and it scares people off. So um, a lot of trust frameworks um, do scale. It's just that they don't appear to scale. They're fractal in scale. They work at different scales and sort of uh, come up uh, together. But, but when analytically minded executives look at them, they're like, well, that won't scale. So we're not even going to try that. And it's, it's very interesting. So um, Sheila Foster, the, the woman I just interviewed a, a week ago, um, she's uh, using a concept called polycentric governance uh, that comes out of some of the work that uh, Eleanor Ostrom did at University of Indiana uh, and is, a, is, is basically how do you do multi-layered governance mechanisms so that authority and control devolves to the people closest to a commons, for example. Um, but that requires these sort of sets of nested relationships. Um, and, and by the way, this is the kind of conversation we'll probably also have on Tuesday next when we're talking about Holochain because the architecture of Holochain lends itself really nicely to this multi-layered, multifaceted, uh, polycentric governance. I, that, that notion just sort of clicked, to, those two ideas just clicked together in my head right now. I, I hadn't thought about that as part of Tuesday, but, but it is. It's part of what's going on here. Um, so uh, there's, there's a whole sort of bucket of issues here. Esty, would you like to jump in? I would. Um, I'm feeling myself called to make a, a version of a statement I've been making a lot recently, uh, which Jerry, you've heard. I, I, I love these distinctions between trust and confidence and this notion of, of betrayal avoidance uh, versus loss, um, because betrayal is a social word. And I'd like to propose that in the spirit of Jerry narrowing ideas that we confine trust or we use trust to describe that emergent phenomenon because it always emerges from the doing of things. That is a social phenomenon. That is, that is people assessing and seeing into one another we are wired to do this. We are wired to do it very quickly with direct contact. I think it's the reason why nested relationships and polycentric governance happen. So for me, it, we, we, we're, we tend to use trust or have been in these conversations of scale in which trust becomes some sort of quantity, some sort of stock that is being built when in fact it is a descriptor of an emergent social phenomenon and the speed of trust, right, is both almost instantaneously and I, I often cite the amazing thing of women meeting each other largely around a round table or especially around a small round table and the, the true trust at the most deep levels of, of what B'nai Brown calls vulnerability emerges astoundingly, right? With a little back and forth and you watch that process. So um, anyway, plea for trust is only a social phenomenon. It is what happens as a result of social interaction for which the human being and other social beings are wired to accomplish in complex and, and glorious ways, which also detect danger when they start breaking down. Of course they do, right? Yeah, Stay, that was a really wise um, statement. And you know what it made me think was both a, a balancing statement to Jerry's point and something that, as I was thinking about the emergent phenomenon, that you know, I think trust you think about soldiers going into battle, uh, it's just as much a masculine you know, issue as it is for a feminine issue. And, and if you look at how much we fight in this society in particular, you know, we're, we've got a fighter for a president, we fight each other in the battlefields and pull it, you know, I mean, trust sets up barriers between us and them as an emergent phenomenon in groups, just as much as it brings people together. As you were talking yesterday, I was getting you know, chills because uh, there's just, so many ways the issue cuts. That's right, that's right. And, and let me say, I, th I think uh, summoning up the experience, that even those of us who haven't been in battle, 
right, with, with, with brethren, because it turns out to feel like siblings, right, in these, that it, it that, that's a, that's a, the, the image of women around a small table and, and fighting troops who were truly a, a troop are, are both easy to sum up and, and uh, carry equally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was it? Go ahead. Go ahead, Dave. I went, I went, I was, I, Jerry and I talked about this a little up, a while back, but I went back and read through the, uh, the Robert Axelrod paper on tit for tat, the repeated game um, competition stuff. I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but the, I was thinking about it in terms of the Trump election, because I think Trump's election represents the last play of a multiple play game. And so the Trump administration will have to basically steal as many chips off the table as they possibly can, because they don't get to play the next game. Um, but it, but it has other implications. And one of the things that Axelrod talked about that I didn't think about was basically the multiple play game, the tit for tat phenomena looks like trust, right? As if you, if you, the winning outcome is to like, just do what the last person did, right? And as long as you're cooperating and you continue to cooperate, then everything works fine and the outcomes are the highest level. That looks like trust. <clears throat> and so I, I wonder, if, I was thinking about the spectrum idea and I think there's a, a spectrum from kind of low cost to high cost trust. So the things that I can do automated automatically is, you know, I just know I'm going to get my, you know, my, I'm not going to get ripped off at the 7-Eleven. I'm not going to get run over at the intersection. I'm not going to get pushed onto the subway tracks. You know, those are kind of low cost trust situations. And then there's a set of high cost trust situations where I have to be actively engaged. You know, am I going to be cheated on races? Or, you know, and um, I, I think, so one of the strategies, it has to be moving. We want to move more uh, interactions from the high cost realm into the low cost realm. So it seems like we probably could come up with rules around how to increase trust. One would be how do we make the multiple play, how do we make the, the interactions more regular and make them you know, happening easier so that they were just used to, used to that kind of behavior. So then they, they, we, don't have to, we don't have to put as much effort into them. And, and I think one of the sides of that has to be, we talk about trust, but really the issue is from our perspective, trustworthiness, right? Mm-hmm. So in the VW case, the issue is what they were trying to decide was, are we going to be trustworthy, right? If, if I'm honest, I'm trustworthy. If I'm dishonest, I'm, I shouldn't be trusted, right? I'm going to try to get away with it. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think that it, as we think about strategies, there's, there are actually some things we could start to break out. Kelly? It just it occurs to me that we are transitioning in, in some sectors, right, from this idea of the zero-sum game to – this idea of abundance and, and I have not spent enough time thinking about it, but how do we shift the narrative, right? Because if what you're doing is playing a zero sum game and you think that you have, that I have to lose in order for you to win, then that's a total erosion, right? There's no, you have no reason to, we have no reason to be in a trust relationship. And so many things now function on an abundance model um, that I, that we have to, so we have to figure out what the ego food is for the people who um, really are into playing the zero sum game, right? How do we change the narrative to get all everyone involved in playing the same game where we're doing better together? Kelly, have you ever heard of a book called Infinite and Finite Games? Oh, James Cars. So James Cars wrote this book. It's a beautiful little volume, and it's you know, really to your point. He um, he basically, his message in the book is there are at least two types of games, finite games, zero sum, and infinite games where the goal is to get as many players as possible. And but the real, but I think his, his, his ultimate point is that the art of life and work and business is really uh, most of the time to try to figure out which games you need to play when. And that's a, that's a really challenging thing to do, you know, in leadership and, and teamwork and, uh, when do you play the infinite game? When do you play the finite game? You have to play them both almost all the time because there are always zero sum competitions in life. It's not an either or abundance versus zero sum. It's actually when do you do which and can you be good at both? <laughs> and then, then things, you know, then things move is his point. It's interesting because we have, we have a series of cultural narratives that we've been sold in my belief um, that put us in this conflict, combat, scarcity situation. Uh, that this is not how early humans worked, uh, and that it behooves a lot of interests, whether it's Wall Street or whoever, to have us in 
this particular way. And if you're in the middle of a consumerist society where everybody's job is to buy more stuff and if we stop buying stuff, we stop, this is the, the, the GDP stops growing and growth is our objective and profit maximization is what all the corporations are supposed to do and uh, sort of uh, uh, luxury maximization is what all the individuals are supposed to do. All of that works together and hangs together as a system. It's just that it's very destructive for everything and everyone in the system but but we are we are like up to our nostrils today in that system and there's a whole lot of uh, organizations who've who've made noble efforts to change the measurement systems for how companies are rewarded like triple bottom line tomorrow's company and, and, a, and a bunch of other things the measurement systems for how we you know, how we look at global uh, wealth and well-being like the Gini index and a bunch of others none of these have broken through and, and, and so this is a very big narrative behind uh, everything that we'll talk about in the relationship economy. It's the, this is, this is the, the current context and it's hot and it's live and it's, it's, it's already eaten everything. And the question is what kinds of messages will break us into the world of abundance that we're thinking about, into authentic relationships at multi-scale levels, uh, you know, things of that nature. I, I, I want to poke in here with the thought that relationship does not require abundance. In fact, we often see the strongest relationships between people who are dealing with situations that are the opposite of abundance. Um, so I'm, I get worried that we, we uh, tag trust because it's of increasing social value to us to some um, sense of progress in the world on other economic bases that's, that, that are really not orthogonal, but not the same, right? They're totally different kinds. Um, yeah. and, um, in, and also the casting behavior as games, right, is part of that, right? I think one of the things that I learned from watching the the actual game gaming industry evolve, right, is is the learning that the goal of most games, which is the goal of life, is to keep playing. That's the infinite it, game. Right, is to keep the game right. And and we never actually know, right, what game we're playing, which is the right strategy, etc. So and and yet, and we do know kind of who's with us or what feels right, or there's an, there's an inter, inner socially mediated um, system that is the, I think it's really the only reliable mechanism we have, right? Mm -hmm. for it. You always have you in relationship to other people or the world around you. So, I want to expand... Anyway. I want to expand a little bit on what I think was one of the warnings you just gave. Um, and I have no idea why Alexa thinks I just talked with her. Um, and uh, that is that I'm really leery of mathematical, scientific explanations of trust and all that, well, sort of like tit for tat and so forth. And I get it that ga and, and game theory has always frustrated me because it seemed like a really ma you know, male thing to go do. Um, and the experiments were always artificial and there was almost never an ongoing relationship between the parties in, in a game theory experiment. Like if you had to live with that person in community for the rest of your days, would you still have done the same thing? Right. Which is, which is kind of the big question, right? It's one of the huge questions here. So the theory, and I appreciate things like, like the Dunbar number, which is if you go and look at tribes around the world, they tend to do pretty well up, up to about 150 and then they split into two tribes or whatever. That, the, observationally, they're interesting, but I wanna caution us against over sciencing this and, and take it back to the, the felt uh, things. And, and uh, Esty, thank you for untangling abundance from relationship and trust and all that. I think I, think I uh, I tend to think of all these issues as, as belonging together, but you're right. In some cases, they don't belong together, you know, in the same bucket. Um, but, but we're also trying to find our way out of, you know, these scripts and these narratives that are the opposite of, of what we're talking about here. Shermay, go ahead. It's funny. Um, how many of you have ever played Dungeons and Dragons? And trust me, this is connected. <laughs> Okay, Dungeons a few of you. Dragons is connected to everything, right? Yes. Um, 
I first started playing back in the 70s, okay? Um, back at a time when it was even more marginal a, a hobby than it is today. You know, role-playing games in general, paper and dice role-playing games. Um, and it was very difficult to explain to people what, what D&D was because it was a game, but it wasn't a game where the point was to beat it. It wasn't a game where the point was to beat each other or to, to defeat each other or to win. The point of it as a game was to continue. It was, you know, the, my, my first brush with an infinite game. Um, and trying to, you know, beginning to see that distinction of a game where you're trying to win, where, you're, where your opponents are each other, versus a game where the point is to tell a, tell a, a story together. And that actually, that strikes me as a much, as a better metaphor for where we are going. If we want to talk about a game, game is a metaphor for where we're going. Games where the point is to tell a mutual story, mm -hmm. to try to challenge each other, not by I'm going to defeat you, but by, by I'm going to make things interesting for you. <laughs> and you're going to make things interesting for me. And I wonder, I wonder if people who grew up playing these kinds of open-ended role-playing games have a different approach to social interactions and business interactions than people who grew up playing Monopoly and Risk and other kinds of endpoint winning games. You know the backstory of the Monopoly game? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, it was usually originally called the Landlord's Game. It was a Georgist idea and it was trying to show how, how stupid and terrible capitalism was. And, and ironically, it gets co-opted and turned into, into the Parker Brothers game about, about the, the, fat, the, the rich white guy. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Uh, I think we have to be mindful that we don't get trapped in our own um, game. Because we seem to like the, the spectrum from uh, infinite to finite, finite, finite to infinite games. <clears throat> but what if a trustful relationship is a game is a is a relationship where there is no game, yeah, not fa finite but also not an infinite game? So the, the more critical question may be: What is a high quality human connection? Um, and and Tom, uh, in our other conversations, he came up with a, a quite sharp phrase to define a high quality connection saying it's a connection where information transfer is rapid, reliable, and noise-free. And I would like to expand a little bit on the noise-free part, because the noise-free, I mean, you can, the noise-free is, is about humans. It's about human noise, whether you take noise as a positive or negative element. But as long as we are in the finite games, and uh, Jonathan, Haidt, Jonathan Haidt has written a whole book about this, about basically human motivations. It's about motivations, about reciprocity, about power, about entitlement, about that sort of things. But the high quality human relation needs something more than the freedom of noise. And that's where we get into uh, other qualities, which are, it's not about games, it's about um, showing care, showing tradition, showing craftsmanship, uh, beauty, proportion, sacredness, that sort of thing. It's not about games, whether they're finite or infinite. And, Peter, uh, yes. Oh, if, were, were you were you finished? Well, uh, uh, I was going to add one thing because uh, uh, in Jerry's, uh, what was it? The key levers or the key points of. Uh, uh, of Rex, where six points social. The, the six a, forces of the relationship economy yeah. free, open, social, abundant, emergent, thrivable. Yeah. I'll write them down in the chat. Yes. And I know that the thrivable is split into more pieces, but if, if I read the material of Jean Russell about thrivable, she's talking about um, uh, coherence, about coherence into, in, uh, amongst three things. It's uh, coherence between narrative, between motives, and governance. So I, I, I like the earlier part in our conversation where we talked about the multi-layered approach, whether it's at the company level or at the family level or even at society level. So what are the elements of narrative 
motive, motives and governance that we have to apply in those different areas to, uh, to reach high quality relationships. And I like the emphasis on narrative. Uh, ST, you were gonna jump in. That was exactly what I was gonna jump in on, yeah. right? Um, and sorry, Peter, for misinterpreting a pause. Um, I, I would like to propose that we, that we define relationship or that we understand that a relationship is a budding narrative or it is an instant narrative. It calls for a narrative. Right? It's established by a little bitsy narrative of that initial creation of the relationship and that it, is a, a, it, it defaults to continuing because this is the fundamental way in which we care for, raise, feed, build organizations and products with and do all the other things we as humans right, do in in our societies. So it's kind of in the middle of the spectrum as the, um, you, you, you have to frustrate it in order to diminish relationship in life because it naturally arises and then it happens as a narrative, which is inherently unpredictable, right? And the more people in that narrative, the more emergent, that that narrative is so for me these the notion of narrative and our ability and, and our our design to really process things through narrative uh which is not just the, the hollywood uh encyclopedia of narratives but right. we we make sense through narrative that trust relationship and narrative are all and, and an assumption of um of default emergence and persistence. So in some ways, I know as a as it's at the point in life in which I sat down and was able to start think asking myself the question, what is it that I as an engineer, technologist, et cetera, community leader, mother, et cetera, as a woman, um, what is my experience of life? It is that it is it is a set of responses to a set of commitments which are relationships mm -hmm. which comprise my identity so 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 there you have it <laughs> i'll shut it. up <laughs> that's brilliant um let's pause for what let's let's just pause for 30 seconds carlos and then uh go back in because we've been talking hot and heavy for for over an hour and that was uh you just encapsulated a bunch of really, really good stuff there that got that has me thinking, and I feel like interrupting and taking us elsewhere. But let's just hold on for a second. And we'll go back to Carlos. Godless, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. Okay, bear with me. I, I can't, the, this conversation is amazing and there's so many thoughts and like, I'm trying to put it together and I'm one of those people that, you know, learns to, know, to understand what he's trying to say as he says it. So bear with me here. But I think one of the elements that I'm a, yeah, I'm a verbal thinker. Um, one of the uh, elements that, you know, when you, when you, this thing of narrative, and trust when we're talking about the harvey weinstein thing and the kevin spacey thing and and all these like scandals of um different companies and whatever one of the good things of technology if we if we channel it right is that um the price like it's much harder now to get away with lying it's just, and and that sort of forces all of us to actually have to have the same narrative. Um, one of the words that I've been thinking a lot, why, like, why is hypocrisy a bad thing? Why are we bothered by hypocrisy? And after a lot of thinking, my theory is that we are bothered by people that want to have two narratives. Like you don't get to have two narratives. No one gets to have two narratives. You don't get to say something to the world and be that to us, but in your own life, be something else. We are all 
we only get a, we all get just one life and one narrative and i think we all expect the world everybody to sort of earn whatever narrative they have um and so when because of the the transparency of connectivity i think it's not that people are going to be nicer because oh we're biologically better it's just that transparency makes you have to stick to one narrative and be con coherent which is the the word that peter said that blew my mind because it's, it's that that um uh, word that sort of i think technology is sort of forcing us to be more coherent together we that we can't just sort of be you know uh, uh it, this ha of course this has a bad part which is well now there's no you know so much uh, privacy and intimacy there's a lot of bad things about it but in terms of trust um or in terms of co coherence and all of us acting together this may be one of the good things of it um just uh, to wrap it up there's this book uh to sell is human by dan pink sort of a mm -hmm. popular writer and and to sell is human i really like because i do believe that we're all in sales in some way or another even though the word is has warm connotations or whatever but a lot of sales is about earning someone's trust and showing that you have your you know other the other person's best interest in your uh, offer or whatever you're trying to 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 promote and his point in the book is that the reason why sales has changed is not so much because oh, salespeople now are nicer is because there's so much more information for the buyer now so the 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 feel is much more even so you better be honest because i can just read someone's reviews i can talk to somebody else, you know to your to competition i can find who worked with in the past and and so people are sort of we're sort of systematically pushed to be more transparent more trustworthy if I lie, someone's going to find out. And so I guess this is one of the, the, the good things of it. Uh, but it, but just because I think it pushes all, you know, we, now we all have one narrative and, and we're all coherent. That's, that's what I like to about, about this day and, uh, and Peter said. Interesting. I, I think that, um, I wish that what you're saying is more true than I see it being in many places. Like Facebook, for example, is the place where mostly you see the good things in people's lives and people are performing a lot and you don't see the dark side of people's lives, except now and then when it breaks through the surface. Um, so I, I think there's a forcing function here. I, you, I, I, as you started saying what you just said, I remember that Sherry Turkle, uh, many, many years ago, she spoke at PC Forum, we invited her in, and, and she had written a book called The Second Self. And, and it was funny, because in a side conversation with her, she said, I'm so happy that you know the, the online stuff has shown up. This is sort of pre-open internet days. Uh, she said, because now my, my postmodern training in, in grad school is paying off. And, and her thesis was kind of that online was going to let us play out all those different aspects of self and that, and that the normal self was the fragmented distributed self. And I was like, no, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. I mean, I get how, that's, I get how online is helping us work out aspects of identity with anonymity or pseudonymity in different roles in different places. But it, my intuition was that the integrated person is probably the healthy person and that you might choose to, to play different roles in different places over time, but, but that it wasn't that this was fragmenting and that that was a good thing, but rather what you, more toward what you just said, which is that um, we need some congruence, some coherence, some sort of healing back of our, our many different kinds of self. And part of what's falling away is the old strictures of, you know, when you went to work, you left yourself at the door. You were your role in the office. And now it's like, it's okay between, uh, you know, always on devices that mean you're all, you know, the electronic leash that, that you're, means you're, you're on call 24 seven. And you know, how do we rein that in? But that means that people see that you're at softball practice or you're at the doctor or you're this or you're that. We have much more visibility into one another's lives than we, than I ever thought, you know, would be possible in my lifetime. So I think, I think that, uh, the whole thing is, is, um, is happening live as we speak. And this whole notion of post-truthiness and uh, who can, you know, how many of the people we're interacting with online are bots and how many of them are actually real? All those things are damaging our ability to cohere and come together in the ways you're talking about. I, I think just to clarify, I think my, 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 my point is it's just that I think depending on what you lie about, the consequences can be much harsher than than before because now there's ways to track almost everything that makes sense but over everything else i, I completely agree with you yeah. esti go ahead uh, i i also was kind of stiffening at the notion of uh converging around one narrative or um needing one narrative 
I think that a, a key piece of this is recognizing that we are composed of multiple roles and commitments. In fact, you are quite literally a different you in every relationship or taking that out of the one-on-one -on -one in every social setting in which you embed yourself. And there is sometimes in a completely legitimate, <laughs> and yes, Jerry says we call this multi-minding, which is my thing, right? Um, uh, we, this is completely legitimate in the outside world in that, and, and in your own experience of yourself where you go, did I just do that, right? Was I just um, the manager who, th th there are, so there are inconsistencies in, in call it the games or the techniques or the, the, the roles that we're producing in our different contexts. And, and that's, again, part of the great glory, right, of being human and of being able now to live lives where we occupy multiple roles at the same time, uh, that, that can be quite different. Um, so um, but that said, right, I think there comes a point in life where, and I think often you can measure this by the point after which you have children, right, where the parent self or the partner self that you are, right, demands to be given at least as big a place, if not a bigger place than some of the other selves you've been and, and cohering them together. But multi-narratives, right, in the same life as a weave of multi-narratives um, is to me the essential understanding um, here. Uh, and relying on our ability to interact with others' narratives and to assess them, which is core social processing. Boy, I'm amazed at the words coming out. Speaking I love of, it. I oh love yeah. It. So, so maybe one of the tasks of our times, complicated enormously by the online medium and Snapchat, Facebook, what have you, is negotiating these different aspects of self and how they're made manifest, how we manage them, uh, all that kind of thing. And, 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 and maybe tools are missing that would help us organize that or figure it out for ourselves. That, that's kind of an interesting question. Uh, but as people are building identity management platforms and more social services, you know, social media platforms and this and that, I, I think they, they would be really smart to consider these kinds of uh, the dilemmas of personal narrative, personal aspects of self and how those are manifest as they're layered inside of social, cultural, political narratives and assumptions made about how things work and how everything fits together, right? And I think in many ways, many of us are hacking those issues in our professional lives. You know, we have a little machete in hand or maybe a little, a little, uh, chisel for to, to like chisel and sandpaper for the wood or we're trying to carve out that thing that we've been talking about in this conversation in our professional lives um, so that more people can kind of benefit from it in that way that could be that could be off but i have a feeling that, that that's close to some of our our missions we're also getting close to the end of our our call time and i wanted to add a couple things about what we might do um, uh, one, uh, I'm, I'm going to send uh, some notes out and create little triplets of uh, members of Rex to go kind of meet together on the side, interview each other, and fill out profile pages on our uh, Rex uh, website, which I will uh, send uh, links to online. I'll basically say, you know, here's, here's a couple steps to go through. But I'd like us to meet in smaller, in, in little groups, and to have an interesting conversation, and then to flesh out some presence for the group of who we are and, and, and uh, some of what we're doing. Um, I'd also love it if, um, if you can spend five minutes thinking about how this conversation applies to what you're trying to get done in the world and post some of that um, to the Rex list, just as a reflection on the call, just like, hmm, he, here's, it, it can be bite-sized, it can be a, a little piece of it that applies, or it can be, you know, bigger or whatever, but if you want to do it just a, a couple minutes of reflection, it can be a couple paragraphs, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a, an essay, but, um, uh, but if you, if you'd like to take it and put it back on the list, I think that would be really helpful because it'll, it'll um, help make concrete for each of us what these things are. 
And then uh, third, um, I will start posting also on the list of upcoming Rex calls from these sorts of things. So I'll get a hold of Mika and schedule something about uh, uh, the, the topic he was bringing up earlier about the speed of trust. Uh, but there, I think there's several kind of interesting uh, to call topics in this conversation. So if you want to recommend those, um, we can schedule them, post them, and see who shows up and uh, keep going as we are. So with all that, are there any kind of wrap up comments from anybody? Uh, what would you like to add to today's conversation? Anybody, Bueller, Bueller? Well, I do think that there is a generational component to a lot of this that um, it's going to be difficult for this particular crowd to address. Um, just looking at how much gray is in all of our hair. Um, it's uh, in part because of the, tech, you know, the technology, the experiences with technology, um, in part because what we, we have a tendency to refer to as technology anything that was invented after we turned 12. And so there are a lot of people growing up who don't think of Snapchat or Instagram or, or mobile phones or whatever as technology. They're just there. It's, it's always, always been, been there. just like we don't think of electricity yeah. as, as a technology. Every year, the Beloit College puts out their freshman uh, list. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to it, but it's really interesting. Uh, every year, they basically say for the class, the incoming class of 2020, uh, we have the America has always been at war. Right. Things like that. And, and you know, they, they don't know what this is. They don't know a world without the Sopranos or they don't, they haven't even heard of the Sopranos because it's been canceled longer than they've been old enough to watch anything. But, but, but it's all these observations about technology, culture, politics, uh, and, and reading the list every year is, is, a, is a wake up call. You're like, oh, damn, that's right. And you know, I just, I, I gave a talk recently about the idea. We, you've probably heard the term digital natives. It's been kicking around for quite some time. You know, you know, and it's basically kids who grew up with you know, being connected. And I think we're, we're you know, heading towards a time of AI natives. You know, we're growing up in a, in a world where everything is responsive. And so the point of all this is that the way we conceive of trust, especially technologically mediated trust and betrayal, may be qualitatively different people who have grown up with a lot of this stuff and they may have a very different perspective and i would really hope that at some point we get a chance to uh, bring some some younger folks in on the conversation to get that perspective uh so there are catalysts invited and coming in carlos is younger than than most of us here he's a, he's here as a catalyst but there's a, another half dozen who i need to basically corral to come join us in these conversations and my hope is that they will provide some of uh, that kind of perspective, including uh, Zach, uh, Dave's son, who's at Minerva. Other, other closing thoughts? Uh, Mark, Todd? You good? Oh, thank you, everyone. Yeah. I really love where that conversation started and where it wandered and where it finished. Same here. I really appreciate it. And uh, we will see each yeah. other in a month for the regularly scheduled call, but in between for these other things that I've been talking about. So uh, keep tuned and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.